It's an invasion from coast to coast, from Africanized killer honeybees in the southwest to South American nutria in Louisiana, to the spread of the Burmese python in the Florida Everglades, all part of a scary trend. Anecdote has long suggested, and the data now show, that many non-native species have the ability to wreak havoc on native species and ecosystems when they are either accidentally or intentionally introduced. Such species are commonly referred to as invasives, and the process by which they gain their foothold is often called a biological invasion. Studying these so-called invasions has developed into its own somewhat controversial branch of science called invasion biology. It might seem obvious that eradicating non-native species is the answer, but not everyone thinks that it is. Some have even likened the field of invasion biology to racism, and even claimed to have traced its roots back to the Nazis. I found ritual parallels between the ritual burning of non-native weeds and the ritual elements found in lynchings of uh, African Americans. And invasion biology is actually currently being used by racist groups today. German historians have actually traced the origin of invasion biology to the Third Reich. This is Adolf. Allegations of xenophobia aside, the field of invasion biology suffers from a certain degree of data deficiency, which makes it often difficult to determine the most effective way forward. We don't know what the impacts of, of the great majority of introduced species are because we haven't studied them. Within the miasma of controversy and data deficiency within the field of invasion biology, there are complexities that extend beyond the strictly scientific into the realm of emotion and anecdote. Why is it, for example, that we have demonized some non-native species as aliens and a cancer, while we give others a pass, even put them on a pedestal? The first fish that I ever caught on a fly was a brown trout on the Baldwin River in Michigan, which is ironically where the first brown trout were reportedly planted in the United States in the 1800s. It's just been a, it's a, it's been a, a fish that's, that's my soul as far as, as fly fishing is concerned. For many U.S. anglers, the brown trout is a revered species, despite the fact that it is not native to the U.S. Despite the fact that the data show the species can place a burden on native fishes, especially under the increased water temperatures climate change can cause. If this is the case, why do so many conservation-minded anglers accept, even revere, non-native brown trout? Why do fisheries managers in states like Maine, which is the most important brook trout broodstock repository in the country, actually stock brown trout and regulate their catch? And why do some conservation and advocacy groups see self-sustaining non-native brown trout populations as part of a healthy aquatic ecosystem? Let's be honest about this. If there weren't brown trout in North America, there wouldn't be fly fishing as an industry or as a sport as we know it today. Many anglers, and many involved in fisheries management and conservation in general, will tell you it comes down to a risk-benefit analysis, wherein the risks, when properly mitigated, do not outweigh the benefits. But what are those benefits? I mean, I'm almost exclusively a fly angler, so I can mainly speak to my sort of tribe. And, you know, most of the people that I run into on streams and, and meet at meetings or, or whatever else it might be are members of a conservation organization or at least aware of some of the conservation issues surrounding the fish they're targeting. So, you know, I, I think anglers, particularly fly anglers, but anglers play a huge role most of the time. And, as the argument goes, because of the success of recreational angling as a sport and industry, there are more people who are on the water and who care about healthy aquatic ecosystems. Anglers were the ones who made sure that those federal agencies were doing their job, and, and anglers were the ones who made sure that there is no Basin Mills Dam in Orono right now, who made sure that the Bangor Dam did not get rebuilt. And so... Um, their voices were critically important. But critics argue the issues are complex, and the data are not at all clear on exactly what the effect of the totality of the recreational fishing industry is on conservation. This is especially the case when the sport of angling is, at least to some degree, predicated on not only an acceptance of non-native species, but in many cases actually promoting them, arguably without the data necessary to truly assess the long-term effects on imperiled native fishes like brook trout, west slope cutthroat trout, and Atlantic salmon. And then there is the bigger issue that affects all animals and plants in our ever-globalized, ever-smaller world. 
Is a healthy ecosystem only comprised of native species? Or is there a place for non-natives? You don't want to sort of take it too naively, I guess, in one direction or the other. You don't want to be too naive about the fact that, yes, you actually do need to handle some of the non-native species, invasive species that are there. And you don't want to be so purist that anything that's not native doesn't need to be there. So it really has everything to do with what the impact of those species have on the things that you value. And those places. I'm Rhett Talbot, inviting you to join my guests and me when we go beyond the data and take a deep dive into the interplay between native and non-native fishes in the next episode of the Beyond Data podcast, coming this Friday to Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. I hope you'll join us. And if you missed the first two episodes in season one of the podcast, this would be a great time to catch up and subscribe so every episode of the Beyond Data podcast will be delivered to you automatically. Thanks for listening.